Greetings, everyone, and welcome to Back to Ashes. My name is Phoenix. Today, I'll be doing something a little bit different. I don't normally do compilations, but this one is really, really talking to me, especially after reading some of the material that I'll be reading to you. Today's video was entitled, True Three Plus Hours of the Unsolved. So, with that being said, before I continue, listening discretion will be highly advised throughout this entire video. I won't be holding back a lot of stuff that I can't say. Of course, there are fluff words that I must use for the other more dangerous words I can't really use, if that makes any sense. It is time to go back to ashes, for once we arise from the ashes, we are a bigger, brighter, stronger, and a happier person in the morning. Sit so back, relax, kick back, grab a snack, or tuck in and get warm, and prepared for your dose of vocal melatonin entitled, True 3 Plus Hours of the Unsolved. Right after this intro, there will be an ad. Right after I read the first case, there will be an ad. Right after the second case, I will read an ad. And then there will be no more ads within this video. To answer your questions, yes, this one does have to have more ads than usual, as that's actually how I make a living. <laughs> With that being said, sit back, relax, and enjoy. Pierre April. Real name, Pierre April, possibly. Case, amnesia. Location, San Diego, California. Date, May 1992. Case, details. In May of 1992, a man woke up in a ditch along a coastline in Southern California. The only item he had with him was a blue duffel bag. He made his way to Highway 1 near Big Sur, California. Eventually, he arrived at a gas station. He went to the payphone, but realized that he did not know anyone to call. At that point, he also realized that he had no idea who he was or where he was from. The only clue he had to identify was a Boston Library card that said Pierre April, which he believed was his name. He had hazy memories of San Diego, which was 400 miles to the south. With just $17 in his pocket, he went hitchhiking. Three days later, he arrived in San Diego. Looking around, however, he did not recognize anything there. Finally, a symptomatic bus driver gave him a free ride to the St. Vincent de Paul homeless shelter. The manager at the shelter believed that his amnesia was genuine. In the months since, he has undergone several physical and psychological exams. Doctors theorize that he was suffering from trauma-induced amnesia. Doctors have noted that it is rare for someone to lose their long-term memory as long as he has. While at the shelter, Pierre began to search for clues to his past. Several things from his memory did not come to him, including knowledge of physics, advanced math, piloting, music, and computers. He believes that he also had some artistic skills. In his duffel bag, a neck brace was found. Pierre believed that he may have injured his neck while playing hockey. He also claims that he can type 85 words per minute. He has learned how to play the guitar in just a few hours. He uses his skill to make money on the streets. Unsolved Mysteries brought in a sketch artist that made two sketches of people who may have been important to Pierre. The first was a man that Pierre believed was his cousin Luke, nicknamed Curly. He believes that Luke is a mechanic who once fixed the tour bus for a famous band in Louisiana. The second was a woman he believed was named Carol, whom he believed that he worked with. Despite all of this, Pierre was unable to find his identity. Extra Notes The case was featured as a part of the September 23, 1992 episode on Unsolved Mysteries. Result Solved 
A woman called the telecenter claiming that she was the man's co-worker, Carol. She confirmed that the man's name was actually Pierre April. Pierre learned that he has two sisters and that his parents live in Lachine, Canada. He also learned that he had been missing for at least five months. Pierre soon talked to his father on the phone and asked him to send a package filled with family photos, his birth certificate, etc. After receiving the package, Pierre's memories started to return to him. He was later reunited with his family, and all of his memories have since returned. The Murder of Tory Stafford, Part 1 Early Life Victoria Tory Stafford was born on July 15, 2000, to parents Rodney Stafford and Tara McDonald. The youngest of two children, her parents divorced when she was only two years old, resulting in she and her brother living with their mother, Tara McDonald, and eventually her new partner, James Gorris. For the most part, it is reported that Rodney largely stayed out of his own children's lives. Tori is described by those who knew her as a bubbly and caring child who fits somewhere between the distinctions of girly girl and tomboy. While she loved dressing up and dancing, she also wasn't afraid to get dirty and go exploring. She had a feisty spirit and loved to make others laugh. While she said to have been a nightmare to wake up in the morning for school, she was always so bright and early on Sunday mornings so she could attend church with her maternal grandmother. During her short life, Tori was extremely close to her older brother, Darren. The pair were best friends and would often walk together to Oliver Stevens Public School, where they both were students. Lead up to disappearance. In early April 2009, Tori and her family moved into a new home, just a block away from her elementary school. They'd previously been residing with her maternal grandmother, and the family as a whole was excited to have a new place to call their home. April 8, 2009 started out as a normal day. Darren and Tori walked to school and spent the day in class before being dismissed at 3.25 p.m. While Darren would usually walk home with his little sister, he first had to drop off some younger children at their home, which was right next door to Oliver Stevens' public school. When he returned, Tori was not there, so he assumed she left without him. It would be her first day walking home alone. According to her teacher, Tori had left the classroom approximately five minutes after her classmates, as she'd accidentally left behind a pair of butterfly earrings she'd borrow from her mother. At around 3.32 p.m., a security camera at College Avenue Secondary School captured footage of her led down Fifey Avenue by an unknown woman in a white coat. Tori herself was wearing a black Hannah Montana jacket with a white fur-lined hood, a green t-shirt, a denim skirt, and black and white shoes. She'd been carrying a purple-pink brat branded purse. Disappearance. When Darren arrived home, he found Tori absent, which struck him as odd since she'd been expected there around 3.45 p.m. He grabbed his bike and went to go look for her but could not find her. Ten minutes later, a friend of hers called the house and left a message regarding her and Tori's plans that evening, as the young girl had invited a few of her closest friends over for a movie night. At 4.30 p.m., Tara left the house and began looking for her daughter on foot. By that time, Darren was visiting with his cousin, who lived nearby. It was there that he received a call from his mother, saying Tori still hadn't come home. She'd contacted some of Tori's friends, but she wasn't with any of them. At 5.20 p.m., Tara called her mother, Linda Winters. The pair drove around Woodstock looking for Tori and came across a police officer parked outside of Oliver Stevens Public School. 
They informed him of the situation and were told to head to the police station to file a missing persons report. Tori Statford was officially reported missing at 6.04 p.m. that evening. Rodney was informed of his daughter's disappearance about 20 minutes later at 6.25 p.m. Search The initial investigation into Tori's disappearance was led by the Oxford Community Police Service. The day after she was reported missing, the agency contacted other police services from around southwestern Ontario to ask for assistance, and the Ontario Provincial Police eventually became involved on April 17, 2009. The night investigators were notified of Tori's disappearance. They searched around her elementary school but found no trace of her. Rodney called around to various family members to see if they'd seen or heard from his daughter and his apartment was searched in order to rule him out as a suspect. Suspicion initially rested on Tara, given how long it had taken her to report Tori missing. During an evening press conference, she and Rodney had gotten into a fight, where he'd called her out for showing what he felt was a lack of emotion, and she'd accused him of being an absentee father. Local residents also believe she was involved due to an Oxycontin addiction, for which she was seeking treatment. Upon hearing the rumors, Tara approached the press to state that Tori's disappearance was not related to any potential drug debt, and investigators quickly ruled out any involvement on her part. In order to further clear themselves, both Tori's parents took and passed lie detector tests. On April 9, 2009, Tori's grandparents offered a $10,000 reward for any information leading to her return. That same day, the surveillance footage from College Avenue Secondary School was discovered. It was noted that Tori did not appear to be struggling against her alleged abductor in the footage. The next day, police received a description of the person seen with Tori saying she was a white female between the ages of 19 and 25. She stood between 5'1 and 5'2 and weighed about 120 to 125 pounds. She had straight black hair that was pulled up into a ponytail, and she'd been wearing a puffy white coat and tight black jeans. The appeal for information regarding the unknown woman resulted in numerous tips. Once such person to call investigators was Tara McDonald, who had been informed by those around her that the woman resembled an acquaintance named Terry Lynn McClintock. Based on the tips, 18-year-old McClintock was arrested for an unrelated warrant for breach of custody and supervision. While she initially denied any involvement in the case, she would later confess to police one month later. The search for Tori expanded outside of her local neighborhood. Investigators with the assistance of the Woodstock Fire Department and an OPP helicopter combed wooded areas and ravines for any trace of the young girl. On April 12, 2009, a vigil was held in Woodstock where Tara made an appeal for Tori to contact the family. This would be followed a month later by an open letter which Tara had written to her daughter. The next day, the official ground search was called off due to a lack of evidence. However, investigators remained hopeful Tori would be found alive. After almost a week of not attending class, Tori's schoolmates eventually returned to Oliver Stevens Public School on April 14, 2009. On April 15, 2009, Tori's case was showcased on America's Most Wanted. Further surveillance footage was released on May 4, 2009. This time, it featured footage of a dark-colored station wagon seen driving down the street where Tori was last seen walking with the woman. On May 12, 2009, McClintock was interviewed a second time where she recounted her activities on the day Tori went missing. Three days later, on May 15, she agreed to provide a written statement to investigators. It was on this day that a second suspect was interviewed. 
28-year-old Michael Rafferty, which whom McClintock had recently started a relationship with. However, Rafferty denied the claim, saying he and McClintock were just friends. He also denied having any information about the disappearance, other than what he had heard about on the news. On May 18, 2009, Tory's family and numerous supporters walked into Woodstock's Victoria Day Parade. On May 19, 2009, McClintock went under a polygraph examination at police headquarters where she admitted to being the woman in the video. It was then she was told she'd be charged with abduction and accessory to murder. Rafferty was also arrested that night. While at his home, police found a missing poster and a piece of paper with Tara's home phone number on it. While he was interviewed a few hours after this arrest, he refused to confess to the crime. It's believed the search for Tory is one of the largest to ever occur in Canada. It included thorough searches of a landfill and officers walking alongside of the 51-kilometer stretch of Highway 401. Arrest and Discovery On May 20, 2009, police charged Rafferty with first-degree murder and McClintock with her two charges. Eight days later, McClintock's charges would be increased to first-degree murder and unlawful confinement. It was decided they would be tried separately. As news of the arrests became public, so too did details about McClintock's upbringing. She'd been born to a stripper and adopted by another by the name of Carol McClintock. It's unknown who her birth father is. Over the course of her childhood, she and Carol moved across Ontario to homes said to be filled with drugs, alcohol, and a parade of men. According to her siblings, the environments she was constantly in were incredibly harmful, and she was known to use drugs with Carol. Despite her brother and aunt trying to intervene by calling the authorities, nothing could be done to change the situation. According to McClintock, she started smoking when she was about eight or nine years old. She then escalated to using drugs and drinking alcohol, which caused her to get into trouble by the law. She's been previously arrested for charges ranging from assault to robbery, and she has since shared a story about her microwaving her dog until it screamed. In 2007, her brother, who was with the Canadian Armed Forces, made her an offer to come stay with him. On the grounds, she followed the rules and attend school, but she declined. After her arrest, McClintock assisted investigators in the search for Tory's remains, with her lawyer stating she wanted the family to know she was doing all that she could do to help. She directed investigators to the area of Highway 6 and Side Road 6 in Wellington County, and a helicopter was used to scour the area from above. When that failed, she was re-interviewed and drew a map of the location where the remains could be located. On July 19, 2009, a police officer was searching a field about 500 meters off Concession Road No. 6 near Mount Forest, Ontario. He'd learned that Rafferty's cell phone had pinged in the area on the night Tory went missing, so he'd stop by the area to take a look. While there, he saw a house that was nearly identical to one described by McClintock. So, he drove down the laneway across from it. He eventually came upon a pile of rocks and the smell of decomposition. It was official. Tory Stafford's body had finally been located. Tory's body had been stuffed into garbage bags and covered with rocks. She was naked from the waist down, wearing only her t-shirt and the butterfly earrings she'd borrowed from her mother. Her remains were brought to Toronto for a post-mortem examination, where it was revealed she died of blunt force trauma to the head. Her body showed signs of a beating, which also caused 16 of her ribs to break or fracture and lacerations to her liver. 
there were also signs of internal bleeding. The lower half of her body was severely decomposed, so it was impossible to prove she had been sexually assaulted. However, <clears throat> based on the available evidence, investigators concluded an assault had likely occurred. Rafferty's car was taken in for examination, blood from two different individuals, one of which, being Tori, was found on the rubber molding of the back passenger side door. Blood was also found inside a gym bag inside the vehicle, and there was a mixture of blood and semen on the back of the front passenger seat. While the back passenger seat was missing when the car was taken into custody, there were witnesses who testified to seeing it throughout the spring of 2009. Investigators learned that a route Rafferty frequented with an ex-girlfriend took him within minutes of where Tori had been killed. As well, it was learned Rafferty had placed a call to his voicemail while in Mount Forest on the 9th of April 8, 2009. They were able to pinpoint the location by using cell phone records and pings from a nearby cell tower, information which also showed he traveled north through Guelph toward Mount Forest on that night. Trial and Sentencing Terry Lynn McClintock was rescheduled to make an appearance in court on April 30th, 2010, but details of the proceedings were blocked by a publication ban. When it was lifted on December 9, 2010, it was revealed she pled guilty to the charges against her and had been sentenced to life in prison with no chance of parole for 25 years. She was initially held at the Grand Valley Institution for Women in Kitchener, Ontario. According to her statement, she was the one who'd persuaded Tori to get into the car with her and Rafferty on the guise of showing her a dog. While she'd initially said Rafferty was the one who killed Tori, she would later change her story to say she was the one who actually committed the murder. While McClintock is not technically able to apply for parole until 25 years have passed, she would become eligible in 2024, 15 years after being sentenced, due to the Faint Hope Clause. It was introduced in 1976 when Canada was abolishing the death penalty and allowed those serving sentences for first and second degree murder to apply for judicial renew in order to reduce their sentences. The purpose was to incentivize rehabilitation with the aim of convincing a justice with the provincial superior court to allow a jury to hear their case and decide if they'd be eligible for early parole. While the law was removed from the books in December of 2011, it still applies to those who were sentenced before the date it was abolished. Lawyers agreed to change the venue for Rafferty's trial from Woodstock to London, Ontario, citing concerns he would not be able to receive a fair trial in the city. Pre-trial motions began in January of 2012, but were subjected to a publication ban. On February 29, 2012, Rafferty pleaded not guilty to charges of kidnapping, sexual assault, and first-degree murder. The trial commenced on March 5, 2012. Throughout the course of the trial, Rafferty sat in the prisoner's dock. The defense argued that he'd been a horrified spectator to McClintock's plan to kidnap and murder Tory over a drug debt and that she'd offered the young girl to him as a sexual gift, an offer he would turn down. He did not take the stand in his own defense. Tori's teachers was one of the first to testify and claimed to have seen her walking behind a woman who had appeared to be in a hurry. It was revealed her information had been used to create a composite sketch of the woman before she was determined to be Terry Lynn McClintock. 
Tara testified that she'd crossed paths with McClintock on a few occasions, once to purchase drugs from her house and another to discuss possible breeding their dogs. She emphasized to the jury that there's no way her daughter would have walked off with a stranger. McClintock was the star witness in the trial. She outlined her and Rafferty's relationship for the jury, saying they'd first met at a pizza shop and had sex in his car that night. The relationship had progressed quickly, with McClintock sharing that she cared deeply for him and would often buy him Oxycontin. On the day in question, McClintock said she'd signed in at the local employment office before returning home, where she found Rafferty waiting in the driveway. He'd ask her if she wanted to travel to Guelph with him, then made his way to the area near Tory's school. It was then he asked McClintock if she'd abduct the young child for him. From there, he outlined the plan. She would abduct a young girl, as they were, in his opinion, easier to manipulate. McClintock told the jury that the two of them parked in the parking lot of the Caressant Care Retirement Home across from College Avenue Secondary School. Her initial plan was to pretend to try and abduct a girl before returning to Rafferty to say the plan had failed. However, she knew he was watching her and decided to approach the first child she saw walking alone. That child ended up being Tori Stafford. After speaking with Tori about their pets, both Shih Tzu dogs, McClintock managed to convince the eight-year-old to come back to her car to meet hers. Once Tori was in the car, she was placed at the bottom of the back seat under Rafferty's coat. During the drive, she continually asked where they were going, to which McClintock responded they were simply going for a drive, as she too did not know Rafferty's end location. Along the way, they stopped at several locations, including Tim Hortons, an ATM, and Home Depot, from which McClintock purchased garbage bags and a clawed hammer. Once they arrived at a seemingly remote wooded area, McClintock claimed she knew what was about to happen. She said Rafferty began to masturbate while driving along the country roads, and when they pulled off into the area, he moved to the back of the car and began to sexually assault Tori, during which the young girl begged McClintock not to leave her. McClintock walked away from the vehicle upon hearing Tori's screams, as they caused her to relive flashbacks of her own childhood, and she only returned once Rafferty had placed the young girl on the ground outside of the car. It was then that McClintock kicked her a few times before placing a garbage bag over her head and hitting her with the hammer. Afterward, McClintock said they hid Tory's body and Rafferty cleaned himself up with water and McClintock's jacket, the same once seen in the surveillance footage. After making efforts to hide their tire tracks, they left the scene and stopped at a car wash where they cleaned and shampooed the vehicle. Once home, she took some Oxycontin. A focus of the trial was the shoes McClintock wore that day. She claimed Rafferty had instructed her to throw them out of the car window while they drove down a side road. They'd been located along a rural road north of Guelph in April of 2009. McClintock revealed her decision to take the fall for the murder if the investigation led to her, and she felt Rafferty had more to lose than she did. She said she was the only one to have wielded the hammer. When asked about her initial denial over being the woman in the surveillance footage, McClintock said she had reached a point where she'd been psychologically unable to fathom that she'd killed Tori claiming she'd blocked the event out and genuinely believed she wasn't the woman in the tape. During the trial, the jury visited the scene where Tory's remains were found. In order to better understand the evidence presented to them, they also heard that Rafferty had been stressed in the days after the murder, as told by a woman named Barbara Armstrong who sold him Percocet during a stop in Guelph the night Tory was abducted. Rafferty's past girlfriends were put to the stand 
throughout the duration of the trial in order to present his character to the jury. What jurors weren't told about were his computer searches, which included the term rape, the child pornography found on his computer, his torture sex fantasies, his past of being a serial cheater, and that he'd convinced a former partner to become an escort, whose earnings he lived off of. On May 11, 2012, after nearly a full day of deliberations, the jury found Rafferty guilty on all charges. Four days later, he was sentenced to life in prison without the possibility of parole for 25 years. Rafferty would eventually try to appeal the decision under the claim the judge had given the jury flawed instructions. For the next four years, Rafferty would work to bring the appeal into motion, but to no avail, as it would be dismissed on October 24 of 2016, the same day it was heard by the appeals court judge. Aftermath On August 8, 2010, Rodney and Darren completed a 3,500-kilometer charity bike ride from Woodstock to Edmonton, Alberta, in Tory's honor. Those in support of Tory and her case annually participate in the motorcycle-centered Iron Sirens ride for Tory Statford. In 2012, McClintock pled guilty to assaulting a fellow inmate while in Grand Valley. The Crown called it a completely unprovoked attack, and in a letter sent to a friend, she'd written that she regretted not causing worse injuries to the woman. McClintock was reclassified from a maximum security inmate to a minimum security one in 2014. In October of 2018, McClintock was moved to the Akima Healing Lodge on the Nekanit First Nation, close to Maple Creek, Saskatchewan. The lodge is run by the Correctional Services of Canada. She was granted the move after she identified herself as an indigenous person. However, if she was actually of indigenous heritage, it has not been confirmed and has been disputed by her own brother. It should be noted that the CSC allows inmates to self-identify as indigenous without needing to provide proof and that non-Aboriginal inmates can live at the lodge as long as they agree to follow its programming and spirituality. Healing lodges were first put forward by the Native Women's Association of Canada in 1990, with the legislation officially passing it in 1992. They were created in response to the amount of Indigenous individuals who were incarcerated as they were overrepresented in the nation's prison populations, and their aim is to reduce harm and bring about healing through the use of cultural teachings and spiritual practices. Currently, there are two ways in which they are run. They can be funded and operated by the CSC and its staff, or they can be funded by the CSC and managed by community partner organizations. Those with knowledge of Canada's prison systems are of two minds regarding the effectiveness of healing lodges. While researchers overall have found that culturally appropriate environments can contribute to the healing process of the offenders, there are conflicting findings surrounding repeat offenses for residents compared to those residing in minimum security prisons. The Okima Healing Lodge is a minimum medium security prison that's unfenced and monitored 24-7 with video cameras. It serves as a place where indigenous peoples can develop a better relationship with their culture through the use of traditional practices and a healing plan that utilizes a holistic approach. Its aim is to focus on issues of employment, family, substance abuse, and education, and its approach includes the use of healing circles, sweat lodges, and pipe ceremonies. Those living at the lodge resided in shared spaces, meaning they clean and cook together and can participate in programming aimed at making life easier for them upon their release. Rodney was contacted for his input about the transfer, but CSC was unable to reach him as he'd recently moved. When relatives were finally able to inform him, 
McClintock had already been moved to Saskatchewan. Angered by the decision, he wrote an open letter to Prime Minister Justin Trudeau, asking him to reverse the move. Residents of Maple Creek also showed their support for Rodney by protesting outside the healing lodge. According to those on the front lines, McClintock had been residing at the lodge for nine months before they found out about the transfer, and they worried for the safety of the children of those currently incarcerated, given her convictions. Prime Minister Trudeau faced scrutiny on Parliament Hill when he acknowledged he didn't have the ability to return McClintock to Grand Valley, given it fell under the purview of the CSC. He was also criticized for referring to the Conservative Party as ambulance-chasing politicians. After conservative justice critic Tony Clement said the move risked hurting the public's faith in the Canadian justice system and could lead to acts of vigilantism. At the same time, then-conservative leader Andrew Scheer said the Liberal Party should immediately reverse the transfer. Conservative MP Candace Bergen introduced a motion in Parliament to both condemn and overturn the decision. After a day's debate, it was defeated, 200 to 82, with all Liberal MPs and the NDP voting against it. Trudeau did not take part in the vote. Under increasing pressure from the public, then-Minister of Public Safety and Emergency Preparedness Ralph Goodell ordered CSC to review the transfer and the general policy surrounding inmates being moved to healing lodges. When asked by news organization CTV, he said prison management officials felt the move was the best way to rectify McClintock's past actions and keep the public safe. Ann Kelly, the then newly appointed commissioner of the CSC, stated she was comfortable with the move and felt it was for the best. However, the chief of the Nikoni First Nation said none of the reserve's elders had been consulted and likely would not have allowed the transfer to occur if they'd been asked for their input. On November 7, 2018, Goodell announced McClintock would be returned to Grand Valley after a brief stay at the multi-level Edmonton Institution for Women and the regulations surrounding inmates' transfers to healing lodges would be made stricter. The new regulations would make it more difficult for prisoners serving long-term sentences to be moved to such facilities. As a result of the move back to prison, McClintock sought compensation for what she called unfair treatment. She claimed the move had led to a loss of liberty and that it had been unreasonably and procedurally unfair and therefore unlawful. The matter was later dropped. Up until her move to the Healing Lodge, McClintock had received 23 infractions while at Grand Valley. Rafferty was eventually moved from a maximum security prison to the medium security La Macaza Institution in Quebec. This too angered the Stadford family. However, despite public outcry, Goodell held firm on the decision insisting the prison was no less secure than others and that it specialized in the treatment of sex offenders. The police response to Tory's disappearance and the failure to announce an Amber Alert was criticized by the public and was the focus of a review into the Amber Alert system in Canada. According to the Oxford Community Police, they'd requested to have one activated, but the OPP said the case didn't meet the criteria at the time. Since the review, the criteria had been broadened, with law enforcement agencies no longer needing proof that an abduction has occurred, only that the missing child could be in danger. Since Tory's death, Rodney had become an advocate for child safety. Over the years, he's attended numerous rallies in Ottawa, to call for stricter prison sentences for violent offenders, including the removal of parole for those convicted of murdering a child or other vulnerable person. He wanted the charge to be called Tory's Law, 
and it has been advocated for by many across Canada. Rodney set up a change.org petition for those wishing to show their support. On Tory's 20th birthday, Rodney asked the residents of southwestern Ontario to honor her life and memory by doing random acts of kindness for those around them. Tara says she suffers from PTSD as a result of her daughter's murder. She started using Oxycontin again not long after and has since sought treatment for her relapse. She shared that she avoids hammers, garbage bags, and the street where she and her children used to live at at the time of Tori's abduction. While she says years of counseling have helped, she found it hard to find a counselor who understands homicide. She had the opportunity to speak with Rafferty, which helped her find some closure, but she refuses to speak with McClintock. Tara has shared that while she and Rodney no longer speak, she's happy to see him advocating on behalf of Tori. She herself has become a doula to help support and guide women when they give birth. It's her way of moving forward from the terrible events that occurred on April 8, 2009. In April 2018, Rodney helped in the search for a three-year-old, Caden Young, who was swept away by the Grand River near Grand Valley, Ontario, during February flooding. Caden's body was eventually found along the riverbank in Bellwood, Ontario. His mother is set to stand trial in relation to his death which was caused by her car being swept into the floodwaters after she ignored a road closure sign. While she managed to get them both loose from the vehicle, the water swept Caden out of her arms. She has since been charged with impaired driving causing death and criminal negligence causing death, amongst other charges. In March 2001, news organization Global News learned that Rafferty had been accused by family members of extorting his mother and grandmother while in jail. One family member alleged Rafferty made calls while he was in maximum security, saying he was in the infirmary and needed money to buy himself protection. It was later found out that he'd only been attacked once and was not in constant danger, like he claimed. He was simply playing on his mother's fears and manipulating her in order to pay back prisoners who were doing him favors, such as purchasing food from the prison canteen. The relative provided Global with copies of checks and money order receipts spanning from 2014 to 2018, which showed his mother had sent tens of thousands of dollars to the spouses of inmates in Quebec and British Columbia. She did not know any of these individuals personally. When Global contacted those named in the documents, they would not cooperate the claims. Rafferty also refused to comment. The relative in question repeatedly contacted the CSC to try and stop the calls, but they continued to occur. He also claimed to have had an email conversation with officials throughout most of 2019 which included him sending copies of the receipts, but he has yet to hear anything further. In a statement to Global, a spokesperson with the CSC said that, given the Privacy Act, they were unable to comment on specifics, but that they review any and all information brought to their attention by victims and the families of inmates. In August 2018, Rafferty's mother died of a heart attack at the age of 60 after suffering previous health issues. Rafferty's family holds him responsible and feels her death was the result of the constant stress she was under due to his calls and the resulting financial struggles she faced. Once his mother was unable to support him, Rafferty turned to his grandmother, who passed away shortly after his mother. The relative who contacted Global claimed he and Rodney had written to the government asking for an opportunity to discuss what Rafferty was doing behind bars and why he should be moved back to a maximum security prison, but they have not received a response back. As for why he's decided to speak out, he shares that he hopes 
it will reopen the conversation surrounding Rafferty's prison move. He also wishes to stand in solidarity with Tory's family. It should be noted that none of the claims presented by Rafferty's relative have been proven. The Disappearance of Gwen Brunel Early Life Gwendolyn Margaret Gwen Brunel was born on December 9, 1995 to Betsy and Andy Brunel. Throughout her childhood and into her teenage years, much of Gwen's energy went into raising and showing purebred rabbits with her nationality recognized for her talents. She began in 4-H and, by 2007, had won the Showmanship Championship title at the Western Idaho Fair. She then went on to compete in the American Rabbit Breeders Association and was named its queen at the national competition in 2011. At the time of her disappearance, she was working to become a certified rabbit judge. On a more personal level, Gwen struggled with a condition that made her moody and inattentive, for which she was taking medication. Lead Up to Disappearance on June 26, 2003, Gwen left her family's home in Boise, Idaho for a road trip to a small town just outside Fresno, California, where she said she was going to meet a renowned rabbit judge. When spoken to after the 27-year-old's disappearance, the person in question denied ever speaking to Gwen or having any knowledge of her plans to visit. At 11 a.m., Gwen set off, promising her boyfriend, Gerald Sanderson, and her parents that she'd keep in touch and that she may possibly make a stop in Reno, Nevada to break up the several hundred mile drive. However, her cell phone signal soon disappeared. Both Gerald and her father tried to get in contact with her over the next several hours, but received no response to their texts. By the next morning, the former was worried enough to share his concerns with Gwen's parents, who reported her missing to the Boise Police Department. Disappearance What happened between Gwen leaving home and her being reported missing is all based on surveillance footage and witness accounts. When she was 20 miles from her residence, she stopped at a convenience store in Nampa, as confirmed by both security video and her debit card records. While the footage showed her purchasing snacks, the most interesting bit was that she'd changed her clothes. She'd left home wearing a blue shirt and Nike brand tennis shoes, but had changed into a red shirt and knee-high dress boots. What also struck her family as odd was that she'd visited the store three hours after she'd embarked on her journey, a rather long time to have traveled just 20 miles. The next time Gwen was caught on surveillance footage was at 12 p.m. on July 27, 2023. This time, she was at the Sinclair gas station in Jordan Valley, Oregon, and she had been seen purchasing gas after which she went to Mrs. Z's convenience store, where she bought herself a water and some peanuts. She'd also ask if the establishment sold razors, but was told they did not. Despite telling the gas station attendant that she was in a hurry, Gwen was seen sitting in her car after an hour. Concerned, the worker went to check on the 27-year-old and was told she was doing okay. Search. Three days after Gwen was reported missing, on June 30th, 2023, her car was found abandoned at Succor Creek in Malhor County, Oregon, just a mile away from Highway 95. It had allegedly been in the area since the 28th, when a UPS driver first saw it parked off the road during his lunch break. A police officer was dispatched to the area for an unrelated reason and, curious, ran the 2008 Honda Elements plates 
and discovered Gwen's missing person report. When found, the vehicle was facing northeast in an area commonly used by visitors to the location. It was unlocked with the key still in the ignition and the windows were partially opened. Also found inside were Gwen's leather shoulder bag, which contained her wallet, credit cards, and driver's license. Travel bags with her personal items, protein bar, wrappers, and empty soda cans, and three cages holding 11 rabbits, five of which were already deceased. A water trough and a week's worth of food were also within the car. Not far from the Honda Element, police found Gwen's purple bathrobe, which had been folded as if somebody had used it as a cushion, as well as the water jug she purchased from the convenience store, now half empty. The vehicle's discovery prompted an extensive search of the area, which investigators and Gwen's family and friends looking on foot, manning ATVs and even going on horseback in an attempt to locate any clues as to her whereabouts. Four trained dogs were also brought in to help with the search. After days of failed efforts, police suspended their official search on July 10, 2023. The next clue in the case didn't show up until two months later. On September 10, 2023, one of Gwen's t-shirts was found tangled in a barbed wire fence about one and a half miles from her car at Dog Creek. This prompted the search to partially resume, with her boots and a pair of mismatched socks being located approximately 80 yards south of where the shirt had been found. Interestingly, the boots had been stacked in a crisscross manner. Details Gwendolyn Margaret Gwen Brunel was missing in Jordan Valley, Malheur County, Oregon on June 27, 2023. She was 27 years old and was last seen wearing a dark colored t-shirt, black leggings and black knee-high dress boots with a flat sole. She stands at 5'7 and weighs between 140 to 160 pounds. She has brown eyes and long medium brown auburn hair that's usually up in a ponytail. Gwen's ears are pierced and she's left-handed. At the time of her disappearance, Gwen was driving a gray 2008 Honda Element with Idaho license plates 5WT6X. Case Contact Information At present, Gwen's case is classified as a missing persons investigation, with her parents concerned that she may have become disoriented and wandered from her car or abducted. There's also a possibility she lied about the reason for her trip, with her family posting that she may have been meeting up with an unknown individual. Anyone with information regarding the case is asked to contact the Boise Police Department at either 208-377-6790 or 280-570-6000. Tips can also be called in to the Malheur County Sheriff's Office at 541-473-5125. Justice for Baby Angel Hope, Mother Guilty of Homicide Decades Later Baby Angel Hope after a week-long trial concluded on August 11, 2023 in York County, South Carolina, jurors found 50-year-old Stacy Michelle Rabin guilty of homicide by child abuse and the death of her baby daughter on August 12, 1992. She had also been charged with murder, although the jury was hung on that charge. Rabin was arrested for the baby's death in 2021. The facts of the case presented were heartbreaking. Rabin gave birth to a baby girl she didn't want. Instead of exploring options like adoption, she stabbed and suffocated the child, wrapped her in a bed sheet, put her body in a Sears shopping bag, and threw the bag in the Catawba River. 
Although the baby had stab wounds, the coroner determined that her death was the result of suffocation. It was confirmed that the baby was only hours old when the bag was found by John Pierce, who was swimming in the river at the time. The community rallied and named the child baby Angel Hope so that she wouldn't be referred to as a baby Jane Doe. They also paid to have her buried at the Forest Hill Cemetery in Rock Hill, South Carolina. The case remained unsolved for almost three decades, but as time passed, as in so many other cases, DNA came to the forefront of the investigation and eventually revealed Raven's connection to the child and the crime. Tonight, hours away from what would have been her 31st birthday, that baby finally got justice when a York County jury found her mother guilty of homicide by child abuse, credited to the news release from the York County Solicitor's Office. Rabin identified in 2020. In October 2020, detectives submitted DNA from the 1992 bedsheet to the York County Forensic Biology Lab for testing. The results identified Rabin as a suspect. Prosecutors said her DNA was in a national criminal database due to a previous conviction for drugs. Deputies obtained a warrant for Rabin's arrest for homicide by child abuse and murder. Rabin admitted to authorities that she had given birth to a baby girl inside a van on August 12, 1992 but told deputies she was not financially stable in 1992, already had another child, and didn't think she could take care of the baby. Instead, she claimed she gave the newborn to a couple for adoption and never saw the infant again. The jury, however, did not believe her, finding her guilty of homicide by child abuse, although the jury was hung on the charge of murder. Sentencing for Rabin's sole conviction will be August 21st when she could be sentenced to life in prison. Although she could appeal the conviction, for now, she remains in the York County Jail. I am very thankful for the hard work of our detectives and DNA analysts. Their dedication and ability to work cooperatively has led to the closure of a case that has haunted our community for years. While nothing can right this terrible wrong, there is some comfort in knowing that justice will be served thanks to the men and women who worked on this case. Quoted by Kevin Tolson, York County Sheriff. Arrest Warrant for Rabin The arrest warrant for homicide by child abuse against Rabin stated that around August 12, 1992, she caused the death of her newborn infant daughter, through abandonment and the death occurred under circumstances manifesting an extreme indifference to human life. The warrant also stated that deputies based probable cause to arrest Rabin on investigation, recovery of the baby, and other physical evidence, forensic testing, and statements of the defendant. David Parker Ray, the Toy Box Killer, and His Accomplices The Toy Box Killer Like any state, New Mexico experiences its share of violence and murder every year. Each incident a tragedy in its own right. However, the state's history is darkened by one particularly horrifying chapter. David Parker Ray, also known as the Toy Box Killer. His nickname derived from the large toy box, a trailer outfitted with various implements designed for sexual torture, in which he abducted women and held them as sex slaves. While typical murder cases involve shocking acts of violence, Ray's crimes extended well beyond that into the realm of the unimaginably macabre. For years, he engaged in disturbing acts of sexual torture and suspected murder. The abductions extreme, cruelly, and murders committed by Ray and his accomplices, Cynthia Cindy Hendy and Ray's daughter, Glenda Jesse Ray, during the 1990s shocked the state and the nation, exposing a level of brutal inhumanity 
rarely encountered even in the grim world of violent crime. Ray claimed to have abducted about 40 victims from several states, though authorities believe that number is likely higher. David Parker Ray, Childhood Born in New Mexico in 1939, Ray lived in poverty with his younger sister, Peggy Pearl Ray, under the stern and watchful eyes of their maternal grandparents, Russell and Dolly Parker. They lived on a quaint ranch, seemingly lost in the vastness of the high desert where discipline was abundant. Their father, a violent alcoholic, would sporadically breeze into his son's life, bearing not gifts of affection but rather sinister offerings, magazines emblazoned with the haunting images of sadomasochistic pornography. Ray's mother, Nettie Opal Jensen, was supposedly part of his life, but specific details about her circumstances during Ray's childhood are somewhat vague in available documents. What is known, however, is that David's formative years were turbulent. He was an introvert in high school, so like vultures circling their prey, his peers swooped down upon his shyness with taunts and jeers. He sought refuge in alcohol and narcotics. This crucible molded the early chapters of Ray's life, chapters that would later unfold into a tale of unimaginable darkness. David Parker Ray's Victims As an adult, Ray lived in Elephant Butte, New Mexico, a small town in the central part of the state, about 150 miles south of Albuquerque and just north of Truth or Consequences. The area is mainly rural and is named after an island in Elephant Butte Reservoir, a larger body of water created by a dam on the Rio Grande. Ray's infamous toy box was located in a trailer near his residence in Elephant Butte. Ray was believed to have started his criminal activities around the 1950s. It's unknown how many women and girls David Parker Ray abducted and raped over the decades because many of them were drugged. Quote, One of his specialties, said Frank Fisher of the FBI, was to give these women drugs that would cause amnesia. But the world ultimately got a shocking inside look at Ray's toy box, Toy Chamber. One of the more chilling aspects of Ray's mythology was using a pre-recorded audio tape, which he would play for his victims after they woke up from being drugged. The tape, a cold and clinical rundown of what they were about to experience, was designed to instill maximum fear in his victims. Cynthia Vigil, Jalamilo's Daring Escape Ray and Cindy Hendy were eventually arrested when one of their victims, Cynthia Vigil Jalamilo, miraculously escaped the toy box after three days of captivity. Jalamilo started selling drugs and sex on the streets of Albuquerque at just the age of only 13. As a young woman, she was lured to Ray's toy box trailer and held captive. She later recounted her terrifying ordeal, recalling how Ray and Hendy handcuffed her and then electrocuted her with a cattle prod. As the couple drove the trailer out to a remote area, Hadamido unscrewed the cabinet to which she was handcuffed and waited for the RV to slow down. But just when she was about to make a run for it, Ray hit the brakes and she tumbled to the floor. Hendy shocked her with the cattle prod again, rendering her unconscious. When Halamido woke up, she heard Ray's voice on the tape telling her in graphic detail what would happen to her as his sex slave. For the next few days, Halamido was tortured and raped. The more pain that I showed, the more I hurt, the more he got off, Halamido said. The Escape But as Ray and Hendy took her from room to room, she studied her surroundings. After three days of torture, she finally got her chance to escape. Hendy left her alone and left the keys to the padlock on the coffee table. As Hadamilo tried to unlock herself, Hendy returned and began beating her. But 
Jaramillo picked up two crucial objects, a phone and an ice pick. With one, she called 911. With the other, she stabbed her captor. Then, she bolted naked and covered in blood down the road. The first car that drove by her stopped, but the woman driving wouldn't let her inside. Jaramillo ran to a nearby trailer and received help from an elderly couple whom she later called her guardian angels. A snippet of Ray's journals. Ray meticulously documented his murderous acts in diaries, noting details like the time and place of the kidnappings. Law enforcement speculated that the actual victim count could be significantly higher. However, Ray's journals offered no insight into the event following his brutal activities, leaving an unfortunate gap in understanding his victim's fate. Investigating the Toy Box Case After police responded to Jaramillo's call, they apprehended Ray and Hindi. The two sadistic Ray desperately tried to paint a picture of innocence, alleging that Jaramillo was entangled in the throes of heroin addiction and insisting their actions were merely attempts to wean her off the devastating drug. However, the walls of deception they attempted to construct swiftly crumbled under the scrutiny of law enforcement. As authorities delved deeper into the foreboding trailer, they uncovered a chilling collection of torture paraphernalia that starkly contrasted the couple's assertions. The evidence they gathered corroborated Jaramillo's herring account and confirmed the sadistic reality of her ordeal. The haunting audio tape was just the beginning, a brutal testament to Ray's intentions. The investigators unearthed an extensive collection of torture apparatus, which included a gruesome assortment of pulleys, whips, and a host of sexually perverse contraptions, revealing the true extent of the horrors that had taken place within the walls of that trailer. Cindy Hendy, Toy Box Killer's Girlfriend Hendy played a significant role in his horrifying crimes. They met in 1997, and not long after, she became involved in his criminal activities. The extent of her participation varies, according to different sources, but it's clear she was deeply complicit in the sexual torture and potential murders committed by Ray. During the trial, she testified against Ray, revealing the harrowing details of their crimes. Hendy was convicted of numerous charges, including kidnapping and criminal sexual penetration. She was sentenced to 36 years in prison. As part of her plea bargain, she agreed to testify against Ray. In 2019, after serving approximately two-thirds of her sentence, Hendy was granted parole and released from prison, which caused controversy considering the severity of her crimes. In March of 2022, she was living in Hamilton, Montana. Interestingly enough, Cynthia Vigil Jaramillo later claimed to have forgiven Cindy Hendy. I think there was a part of her that was David Parker Ray's victim too. Glenda Jean Jesse Ray, Ray's daughter. Ray's daughter, Glenda Jean Jesse Ray, was also implicated in her father's horrific crimes, accused of actively participating in the abductions and tortures that took place in Ray's toy box. She was arrested by the FBI and initially charged with 12 criminal counts, including kidnapping and criminal sexual penetration. David Parker Ray ultimately pled guilty to the myriad of charges against him to spare his daughter a lengthy sentence. As a result of his deal with prosecutors, his daughter, Glenda Ray, was given a two-and-a-half-year sentence with five years probation for her role in abducting Garrett. Her whereabouts today are unknown. Street Safe, New Mexico Cynthia Vigil Jaramillo went on to become a founding member of the nonprofit Street Safe, New Mexico. Through her work, with co-founder Christine Barber, 
Hadamido helps give protection and assistance to women living on the street, especially those who are sex workers and vulnerable to violent predators. Hadamido and Barbara testify in court when a woman gets raped, ensuring the victim gets the last word. Street Safe assisted the Albuquerque Police Department with investigating the West Mesa serial killer, the Bone Collector, who also preyed on sex workers, as many serial killers often do. As far as her role in stopping David Parker Ray, Jaramillo remains both modest and strong, saying that she didn't save other women, she saved herself. I'm not his victim, Cynthia said. I was never his victim. I wish he could have known that. Toy Box Killer Documentary In 2008, a British production released The Sex Chamber, a 45-minute documentary piece about the case of the Toy Box Killer, directed by Nick Gudrich. For those that are interested, you can find the video online by typing The Sex Chamber Documentary. Mary Collins, tragic murder of a girl who just wanted friends. In a world where it seems essential to fit in, one must hope teenagers choose the right friends. Adolescence is when teens spread their wings and parents give a certain amount of trust. As parents, we wait up at night when they are even a little bit late and we can never imagine that their friends would hurt them, let alone kill them. Mary disappeared on March 28th of 2020, the day the governor of North Carolina issued the stay-at-home order for COVID-19. Because of the lockdown, this dreadful story went largely unreported. Who was Mary Collins? Mary Santina Collins was born on July 6th, 1981, to her mother, Casey Del Pezzo. At 20 years old, everyone who talked about Mary described her as kind and gracious. Her elementary school principal, Carolyn Horn, described her as innocent and said she always wanted to hug her in the hallway. People also used the words sweet and vulnerable to define her. She had such a light about her. Mary's aunt, Kara Williams, told WCNC News, she was loving and just very silly. Her grandmother, Mia Alderman, raised Mary like her child, giving her a stable environment to thrive, which her mother could not provide. Mary had a large family of aunts, cousins, siblings, and her mother, who all protected and loved her. She was just the sweetest person that she expected everyone to be like that. And so, she was very vulnerable and easily manipulated. Kara told WCNC. At just three years old, Mary was diagnosed with a rare genetic disorder called Velocardiofacial Syndrome, which posed some difficulty for her. It can cause learning disabilities, developmental delay, skeletal abnormalities, immune deficiency, and neurologic and psychiatric problems. Mary had a severe speech impediment and the mentality of a 15-year-old. Counting change or navigating her neighborhood was difficult for her. She was also born with a severe cleft palate and didn't speak until she was six years old, and her speech was difficult to understand. However, by the time she was in her teens, she could talk to anyone but could not make loud noises or scream. Mary loved cooking, listening to music, and doing photo shoots that captured her extraordinary beauty with her dramatic makeup and various hair colors. The Bully High school was a fairly good experience for Mary. She hung out with a small group of girls and was not overly picked on. She went out with a couple of boys, but they were normal teen relationships of short duration. One boy was Lavi Pham. The two did everyday adolescent things like listening to music, eating sushi, and spending time with family. 
However, the relationship did not last long, and there were no hard feelings after the breakup. Mary and Lavi continued their friendship, evolving into pleasant acquaintances. After high school, Mary's friend list diminished. As people were going to college, working, and writing for adulthood, Mary was still a 15-year-old in mind, and she wasn't ready for life changes. With Mary's entire family so protective of her, it was especially concerning when a young lady named Kelly Lavery put a target on Mary's back and began bullying her on social media. Kelly would pose comments like, Ew, nobody would want you. If I were you, I would want to disappear as soon as possible. Or, you're a dumb bitch. Kelly would verbally abuse Mary, then apologize and pretend to be friends with her. Because Mary was so forgiving, she perceived that Kelly was being sincere. Kelly began living with Mary's former boyfriend, Lavi, and continued manipulating Mary's feelings. Lavi even participated. Mary's family could see all of Mary's social media activity and surmised that Kelly had severe mental health issues. They tried to caution Mary that Kelly was not her friend. Mary was already insecure about her speech disorder and glasses, and the last thing her family wanted was to see her suffer at the hands of Kelly. Who is Kelly Lavery? Kelly Lavery was born to Patrick and Karen Lavery and lived a privileged life. Her father is a chief enterprise architect in a prestigious and lucrative position, and Daddy gave Kelly anything she wanted. Kelly grew up in a million-dollar home at 1047 Rolling Park Lane in Fort Mill, South Carolina. She was known to harass other girls, and Mary was no exception. According to Annie Elise, host of the YouTube channel Law and Crime Network, Kelly would write to Mary, I am not jealous. You're really effing stupid. I graduated with a 4.0 in honors, so I don't think so. I'm living rent-free, bills-free. My entire life is handed to me on a diamond-encrusted platter. So, I don't think so, sweetie. Mary asked Kelly why she was so mean to her. And Kelly replied, See, you want to know why it doesn't matter? My parents are millionaires. I get to have a bad personality. Are your parents private jet rich? Tesla rich? Designer shit rich? Does your daddy make $700,000 annually? I can treat people however I want. Kelly was the epitome of spoiled and would rub it in the faces of others. When Mary Vanished Mary left her home at approximately 2.30 p.m. on March 28, 2020, and was last seen walking along Burnley Road in Charlotte, North Carolina. Her so-called friends, Kelly and Lavi, had sent an Uber to pick her up and take her to the couple's upscale Noda, North Davidson, apartment. Knowing Mary's problems with Kelly, Mary's grandmother and family were adamant that she stay home that day. However, wanting to encourage her independence, they gave in and Mary went. Mary's grandmother, Mia, didn't hear from Mary after texting her several times and became worried. The following day, on March 29th, Mia tracked Mary's phone to Kelly in Lobby's apartment and went there. When she arrived, Mia knocked and knocked and got no answer. Finally, she began yelling, I guess I'll have to call 911. Kelly answered the door and told Mia that Mary had already left. Mia asked to look around the apartment, and Kelly hesitantly agreed but would not let Mia in the master bedroom. She told Mia that friends were in there and accused Mia of alarming them. Mia begged Kelly to tell her where her daughter was, and Kelly responded, I couldn't give a flying rat's ass about Mary. Crying, Mia asked if Lavi was in the master bedroom, and Kelly reluctantly went to get him. Lavi came out, and Mia began asking him where Mary was. 
Kelly, in complete control of the situation, would not permit Lobby to answer the questions. It was then that Mia saw Kelly holding a hammer in her hand. Mia looked at Kelly and said, You can't hit me hard enough with that hammer to make me forget about Mary. Kelly then began talking kindly about Mary and said she would help her find her. Mia left and searched around the apartment complex and the neighborhood. Mia filed a missing person report with the Charlotte Mecklenburg Police Department at 11 p.m. on March 31st. She told the investigators that Mary had a cognitive disability and she didn't feel the police department took it seriously. Mary's mother made flyers and the family posted them all around town. Initially, the police went to Kelly's apartment. When they got no answer, they left. Mia was not satisfied that the authorities had yet to talk to anyone at the apartment, so she decided to go back. She called the apartment manager, who agreed to look at the surveillance footage later that day. Detective Jonathan Gaskin told her she could not go back to the apartment that day, but recommended that Mia call 911 again to request the department go out if she felt Mary's life was in extreme danger. Gaskin said he could work the case remotely and that going to the apartment was unnecessary. That would be the first of many disappointments for Mia. Mia informed Gaskin that the manager had surveillance footage and he replied, that's good. The detective did not go to view the footage himself. Mia decided she was not getting anywhere with Gaskin, so she called 911 again. Mary's mother Mia at the apartment, and they waited for the police to arrive. When the officer arrived, he knocked on the door, and Lavi answered but refused the officer's entry. Instead, Lavi let Casey in. This time, he let Casey into the backmaster bedroom, and she saw someone asleep in the bed. Lavi told her it was Kelly. Casey left without being any closer to finding her daughter. The responding officer called the office manager and told him to stop looking at the surveillance footage. He inaccurately told the manager he needed to obtain a warrant to view the tape, which was not correct and proved to be one of many mistakes the police department made investigating this case. By the time the police wanted to view the footage, it had been deleted just one hour before the request. Such an error by the police department left Mary's family feeling alone and frustrated. So, they organized search parties, conducted their own social media investigation, and questioned anyone who would speak to them. They even took shifts outside of Kelly's apartment to ensure no one brought anything out. During the family's investigation of social media, they saw a picture posted of Lavi and another unidentified man who had a knife in his hand. They discovered it was James Jimmy Salerno and he had been at the apartment at the same time as Mary. The family continued to search using bloodhounds and drones for any sign of Mary. Despite their efforts, they felt that Mary had never left the apartment. At one point, Mia obtained permission from the apartment management to bring the bloodhounds into Kelly's apartment to search, but was told they needed a signature of approval from the lead detective, Gaskin, who never responded to their call. They missed the opportunity. Seven days passed before the Mecklenburg Charlotte Police Department would begin seriously looking into the case. A former homicide detective called the department to inquire about Mary's case and was told that they had received an anonymous tip that Mary had gone missing before. This is why they treated the case with such low priority. We can imagine who made the anonymous phone call. A witness comes forward. On April 2, 2020, the police department received a tip from a witness that said James Jimmy Salerno, 20 years old, Lavi Pham, 21, and Kelly Lavery, 24, had a party at their apartment where Lavi and Kelly tied Mary up and beat her up in the bathtub. 
The witnesses tell police that Jimmy was bragging about hiding her body in a mattress and how they planned to burn it with Mary's body stuffed inside. Missing person detectives visited the apartment of Kelly and Lobby on April 2, 2020, where Mary had gone and said Lobby agreed to let them do a consent search. Because it was a consented search, police were limited in what they could touch and do. However, detectives reportedly looked under the mattress, not realizing Mary's petite body lay inside. Another witness told police that Lobby was trying to pay someone $4,000 to remove something from the apartment. The witness also said another young woman named America Deal was potentially involved. The witness said Jimmy had confided in him that all of them were hanging out at Kelly's apartment when Kelly and Lobby began beating Mary in the head with a bottle while Mary lay in the bathtub bleeding. Police then obtained a search warrant. This time, they found Mary's body in the mattress. No one could have prepared them for what they had just seen. Mary's body was very well concealed, and I think some of that is reflected in the court record. Detective Brian Crum told WCNT News in an interview, When we went in with a search warrant, it wasn't even apparent until we began looking more closely at things. Detectives had to open the mattress to find Mary. Detectives also found a bloody knife in the corner of a room and Mary's identification and debit card lying on a table. In the master bathroom, they found a serrated knife in the sink. Luminol detected blood on the bath mats and the shower curtain. Luminol on the bathtub and sink lit up like fireworks. Arrests on April 5, 2020, police arrested Kelly and Lavi at the apartment, according to nightlab.com. Kelly was reported passed out, and police woke her up to arrest her. Jimmy was arrested at his residence in Charlotte's University area. In June, police arrested America Deal, who had fled to Colorado. They extradited her to North Carolina. Each was questioned and tried to blame the other for what had happened. While being questioned, the detective noticed that Lavi had a cut on his arm, covered in saran wrap. Lavi told the investigator that he had cut it while playing with a knife. Lavi lawyered up when detectives began asking more pointed questions about what happened to Mary. Kelly was questioned next. She said she hung out with Mary until she left her apartment for a photo shoot. When explicitly asked about what happened, she also requested an attorney. Third was Jimmy. He blamed Kelly, Lavi, and America, who had just begun dating Jimmy and barely knew Kelly and Lavi. When questioned, America explained that she had just met Jimmy on Tinder and hung out with Lavi and Kelly for a week before Mary's death. She said Jimmy called and asked her to come over because a strange girl was at their apartment. She said that when she arrived at the apartment, Kelly, Lavi, and Jimmy were all doing drugs, including Xanax, Molly, or a.k.a. ecstasy, cocaine, meth, and roxicodone, which is a semi-synthetic opioid. She said she did a little bit of cocaine and Molly. She told detectives that Kelly and Lavi proposed a threesome to Mary, but she refused. Then they asked America, and she claimed she refused too and went to bed. America claimed she woke up at approximately 7 a.m. to take her mother to work and return to the apartment. When she returned to Kelly's, Jimmy ushered her into the bedroom and opened the door to the bathroom, which was entirely covered with blood and she was horrified to see Mary in the bathtub. Lavi gave Jimmy and America money and told them to go to the store for cleaning supplies and bleach. When they returned, America said Kelly held a knife up to her neck and forced her to wrap up Mary's body in saran wrap and clean the scene. She noted that Lavi and Jimmy laughed and talked about the terrible things they had done to Mary. After they sexually assaulted Mary, 
America said they let her bleed out from a cut to the neck and made her watch Lavi and Kelly have sex. The one consistent thing in all of their accounts was that Kelly was the ringleader and had perpetrated the violent stabbing. According to America, Kelly had gone primal and did not stop stabbing. Mary had accidentally cut Levi's arm with a knife. The lingering question is, why? Despite the information obtained in the interviews of the four perpetrators, police were no closer to an answer. Police charged Kelly, Lobby, and Jimmy with kidnapping, murder, and concealing a death. America was charged as an accessory after the fact and concealing a death. The Night of the Murder According to her family, Kelly, 24, and Lavi brought Mary sushi in the hours preceding the murder. They posted a video of the three of them together to make it seem like Mary was okay and just hanging out with her friends. Lavi posted a video of the three of them having fun on his Twitter account. Her family believes he did that to make it seem like Mary was okay and just hanging out with her friends. Police believe that Kelly, Lavi, and Jimmy brutally attacked Mary, stabbing her more than 133 times. Police found text messages between Lavi and Kelly while Mary was there. The text conveyed that Lavi began drugging Mary after they had sushi. He used Xanax and Molly. In one text from Lavi to Kelly, he said, Another bar down. During that time, Lavi also sent text messages to Jimmy, relaying information about what he was doing. Mary was the only person who did not know what was happening. She must have been so afraid. Autopsy Report J. Michael Sullivan, M.D., conducted the autopsy, which contains unsettling and graphic details. In the report, it says Mary died of multiple cut wounds and stab wounds of the neck, torso, head, and extremities. She suffered 133 slice wounds and 24 stab wounds, none deep enough to kill Mary, but enough to torture her. There was also blunt trauma injuries along with multiple facial contusions. Mary had also been violently sexually assaulted. According to Law and Crime Network, the DNA of two male individuals was found on her body. Due to contamination and degradation, when the killers tried to clean up after the murder, the DNA was inconclusive. It is reported that Kelly, Lavi, and Jimmy committed the murder and left Mary bleeding out in the bathtub. They wrapped Mary's entire body in saran wrap and black garbage bags with silver duct tape covering most of her body in an overlapping, circumferential fashion. Sullivan found a black shirt and socks wrapped around her head and a red shirt around her ankles. It is believed those items were placed on those locations of the body to soak up blood. Mary had a chain collar on her neck attached to a leash when she was found. Her body was identified by dental comparison. Cleanup Warrants reflected that Mary was saturated in Cascade dish detergent and pumpkin spice shower gel to cover the smell of her body. After wrapping her up, they hid her body inside a mattress. Analysis concluded it was America's fingerprints that matched the inside of the trash bags used to conceal Mary's body. During a bond hearing for America, her attorneys argued that she should be released, claiming America was forced to help and Kelly was in charge. According to America, Kelly was the ringleader and gave orders to everyone during the cleanup. Against the family's wishes, the prosecution struck a deal with Kelly. She pleaded guilty to second-degree murder, kidnapping, and concealment of a body and was sentenced to a mere 25 to 30 years in prison. Remembering Mary Mary's aunt, Kara, had struggled with the death of her precious niece. Kara told Charlotte Michelle Bowden of WCNC, I think that they are evil. 
I think that they are what evil looks like. They tortured her. They stabbed her over a hundred times, and then they hid her body in a mattress. To know this happened to Mary, who I just know was so excited to hang out with some friends, and I can't imagine when they started to turn on her, the fear and confusion she was feeling. And then to think what she went through. It's so horrible, absolutely horrible. Kara says the most challenging thing is having to think about how they tortured Mary and how she can't take the pain away that Mary must have experienced. It's not something you forget, and time will heal, and you will move on from, said Kara. It stays with you, and the mental images stay with you. Kara and Mary's grandmother now have post-traumatic stress disorder and say it affects everything in their lives. They are unable to even watch the news for fear of seeing reports about other murders triggering their symptoms. Mia found Kelly's plea deal hard to accept. Nobody is going to tell me that Mary's life, the value of her life, is 25 years, said Mia. Mary mattered more than that. The demanding defendants await trial dates, and Jimmy and America are out on bond. Due to a backlog of cases in North Carolina, it could be years before they go to trial. In the meantime, Mary's family has set up a nonprofit organization called Mary's Voice to promote awareness of Mary's case, highlight flaws in the death penalty, and create an additional national alert for missing persons with disabilities and improve police response. The criminal justice system failed Mary and her family from the day she went missing. Now, we can only hope that the jurors see these monsters for who they really are and that they get life in prison and nothing less because Mary never got to negotiate a deal for her own life. Before I begin this next serial killer, I also narrated this over on my horror channel, but I hope the story's a little bit different and gives more information than what I read before. Anyway, this is one of my most shocking serial killers. All right, here we go. Herb Baumeister, serial killer linked to dozens of murdered gay men. A typical Midwest family man. Herbert Herb Richard Baumeister, 49, was a businessman, husband, father, and suspected serial killer. During the 1990s, Baumeister was a resident of an Indianapolis suburb of Westfield, Indiana. He is suspected of luring over a dozen gay men to his house before murdering them. Baumeister committed suicide soon after his property was searched and bodies were found in 1996. Recently, the Hamilton County Coroner's Office and authorities have renewed efforts to name those victims who remain unidentified. A Gruesome Discovery On June 24, 1996, Baumeister's youngest teen son, Eric, discovered bones while on the family's 18-acre Fox Hollow Farm estate in a secluded wooded area of Hamilton County. The bones were located approximately 60 yards from the home. Dayton Daily News reported that Eric found a skull and showed it to his mother, Julie Bellmeister, who located the rest of the skeleton in the fallen leaves. When she confronted her husband, Baumeister explained it away, telling his family it was a medical skeleton, part of his late father's anesthesiology medical practice. Baumeister said he had buried it in the yard after finding it in the garage while cleaning it out. It seemed to make sense to his wife, as Baumeister was a collector and kept everything. At that time, the discovery was only mentioned in the Indianapolis Star. There were no headlines, but the incident started an investigation. The bones were identified as human three days later, 
along with additional remains found by Hamilton County first responders. Authorities were puzzled, and former Sheriff Joe Cook told the Indianapolis Star, it's an unusual spot to find bodies. Most of the bones were located in two dense locations in the woods, some partially burned. During the search in 1996, authorities discovered over 10,000 bone fragments belonging to several men. The remains are still being analyzed today and compared to missing person files in the Federal Bureau of Investigation, National Crime Investigation Center database. Police estimate there are as many as 25 victims located at Fox Hollow Farm. Baumeister committed suicide by shooting himself in the head less than two weeks after the remains were discovered. Sergeant Kenneth C. Wisman told the New York Times that his suicide note did not mention the murders or the remains found on his sprawling estate. Who was Herbert Baumeister? Herbert Baumeister was born in Indianapolis, Indiana on April 7, 1947 to anesthesiologist Herbert Eugene Baumeister and Elizabeth Baumeister. He was the oldest of four children, and he reportedly grew up in a normal suburban childhood until adolescence when he began exhibiting antisocial behavior. His friends reported he displayed traits of urophilia, a condition that caused him to wonder what tasting human urine was like, creating sexual arousal. Baumeister also liked urinating on teachers' desks and played with dead animals. During his teens, his father sent him for psychiatric evaluations and he was diagnosed with paranoid schizophrenia and antisocial personality disorder, but he never received any professional treatment. He attended North Central High School but never fit in and would spend much of his time alone. In 1965, Baumeister attended Indiana University but dropped out after one semester. Later, he attended Butler University for one semester. Baumeister bounced around jobs as an adult. Though he had a strong work ethic, his behavior became progressively bizarre. In 1971, Baumeister married Juliana Julie Sater, and they had three children. Julie would later tell others that they only had intimate sexual relations six times over the 25 years of marriage, and she had never seen her husband nude. Six months into the marriage, Julie told Baumeister's father that he had been hurting and needed help. So, Baumeister's father had him involuntarily committed to a mental institution for two months. Later, Baumeister created a Save-A-Lot thrift store chain in Indianapolis, which became quite successful. Baumeister and his wife purchased the Fox Hollow Farm in May of 1988. How did his wife not know? Julie, who was 48 by then, usually left town once a month with her son Eric, 15, and daughters Emily, 12, and Marn, 17 to stay at a lakeside condo about 100 miles north, owned by Baumeister's mother, Elizabeth. To Julie's knowledge, Baumeister stayed home during the week, tending to his own company. Julie would later find out that her husband frequented Indianapolis gay bars at night. Baumeister had other chilling secrets. While Baumeister visited his condo, police found thousands of partially burned bone pieces that belonged to seven people. Initially, four were identified by authorities. Stephen Hell, 26, Roger Allen Goodlet, 33, Richard Hamilton, 20, all from Indianapolis, and Manuel Resendez, 31, of Lafayette, Indiana. All had frequented the same bars as Baumeister and vanished on days Julie had been out of town. The day after authorities began searching the Fox Hollow Farm property, Baumeister disappeared. He remained missing for eight days until campers found his body in Ontario's Pinery Provincial Park, lying beside his car. He had shot himself in the head 
with a 357 Magnum. Baumeister left behind a three-page suicide note that rambled on about being sorry for the family's financial woes as his company was almost bankrupt. He never once mentioned the horrific crimes he allegedly committed. After the incident, Julie was in shock. She had led a private life with a close-knit family and had very few friends. She recalled that she and her husband doted on their children, and Baumeister was involved in every aspect of their upbringing. To those outside the family, they lived an idyllic family life. Julie had no idea Baumeister was a predator and would frequently go to the Metropolitan Restaurant and Nightclub, a popular destination for gay males. The owner of the club, Jim Brown, told People Magazine that Baumeister never seemed comfortable being there. Men Disappearing in 1993, gay men began vanishing from Indianapolis. Ten would disappear over two years. Authorities searched gay bars, questioned patrons, and posted flyers, but leads were few. However, in 1994, a man told the police about an encounter he had with a man named Brian. He said they went to his estate, and at Brian's direction, they engaged in autoerotic asphyxia, which involves sex and suffocation. The man had been distressed by the encounter, and in 1995, he saw Brian again. Concerned about the rash of disappearances of gay men, he wrote down Brian's license plate number. That was the critical lead that police needed to identify Brian as Herb Baumeister. Was he operating before 1993? Between June 1980 and October 1991, authorities began finding bodies along Interstate 70. Still unsolved, the serial killer was given the nickname I-70 Strangler. The killer met his victims at popular gay bars within a four-block radius of Indianapolis. Authorities believe Baumeister was also the I-70 Strangler. In total, 12 men were recorded as his victims. According to FBI profilers, the killer was a white man between the ages of 20 and 30 who worked in a low-skilled job with a fan of military paraphernalia and led a healthy lifestyle. During the day, the killer would express homophobic views, but secretly a latent homosexual who murdered the young men due to self-hatred and shame. After the remains were located at Baumeister's property, he was named the primary suspect in the I-70 cases. Alan Livingston of Indianapolis went missing when he was 27 years old in August of 1993. He is one of the first victims identified when County Coroner Jeff Jellison sent a batch of 44 DNA samples to the state police in late 2022. Authorities have now linked Baumeister to nine victims. Jellison asked family members of missing men during the 1980s and 90s to submit DNA samples to help with identification. Eric Pragner was one of the first family members to answer the call and submit his DNA. It confirmed Alan Livingston was one of Baumeister's victims. Pranger told the Indy Star that he submitted his DNA because he suspected Livingston could have been one of Baumeister's victims. Pranger was only six years old and did not know his cousin that well, but there was a rush because Livingston's mother, Sharon, had terminal cancer and deserved to know what happened to her son. Officials say the investigation is ongoing as they work to identify nearly 10 thousand human remains recovered from Baumeister's property. As for Julie and her children, they remain shocked that their husband and father could have committed such gruesome acts. In the scope of things, Julie and her three children are also victims of Baumeister and must try to reconcile their love for him alongside his utter betrayal. Our biggest question now is how he could have loved us and done this. Julie told people, happiness as we knew it is never going to return.
Joey Moss. Real name, Dubinian Joseph Moss. Nicknames, Joey or Duby. Location, Orlando, Florida. Date, November 30th, 1990. Bio, occupation, student. Date of birth, July 2nd, 1985. Height, three foot, eight inches. Weight, 45 pounds. Marital status, single. Characteristics, white male with brown eyes, brown hair, and a freckled birthmark on his left eyebrow. The case. Details. October 1990, 33-year-old Kathy Alter filmed her five-year-old son, Joey, who had just learned how to swim. One year later, the video is all she has left of him. On November 30th, 1990, he was abducted by his 36-year-old father. He has not seen Kathy for more than a year and does not even know that he has an 11-month-old baby sister named Elizabeth. Kathy and Jerry met in 1983. She had just finished nursing school. He was a bricklayer, working in New York City and commuting home to the suburbs. She recalled that he had a very strong personality. When he was in a good mood, he was the life of the party. He was very intelligent and seemed very confident in himself. In 1980, she found out that she was pregnant. She moved in with him, thinking marriage was around the corner. But for him, marriage was out of the question. When Kathy and Jerry started living together, he set guidelines of how he wanted things to go in their relationship and the whole household. He wanted as much freedom as possible, as if he was a bachelor. She never knew what time he would come home. Although he would get off the train at 7 p.m., there were times that he would not come home until 11 p.m. He would never call or consider what she was going through. On one occasion, when Jerry came home late, he asked where his dinner was. Kathy told him it was ready hours ago when he was supposed to be home. He told her that he stopped at a bar with some friends. She asked if he could just at least call her to let her know he would be late. He became angry, saying that he did not need permission to be out and that he worked hard so he should have a warm meal ready when he comes home. He then demanded her to make him a new dinner. On July 2nd, 1985, Kathy gave birth to a son. Jerry named him Dubinian Joseph Moss, after one of his favorite football stars, Albert Dubinian. Jerry's nickname for him was Duby. According to Kathy, Jerry paid the rent. She alone was responsible for all of Joey's expenses. She began to work the evening shift as a recovery room nurse. Then, in 1987, she took on the added burden of painting and remodeling the kitchen. One day, she came home from work, walked in the kitchen, and found a message from Jerry written in red crayon on the wall saying, get more baby bottles. She was furious since she had spent so much time working on the kitchen. She felt as if he was saying that he did not care about anything she did. Kathy had had enough. Jerry had not spoken to her in weeks. In late August of 1987, she took Joey and left and then found an apartment in Burplank, New York, 20 miles away. A few months later, she began dating a medical student named Mike Alter. In 1988, when he was in his last semester at medical school, him and Kathy got married. Joseph, or as known, Duby, was the ring bearer. Mike had been accepted into a residency program in Orlando, Florida. Jerry fought to obtain a restraining order, barring Kathy from taking Joey out of New York. Mike did not want to replace Jerry's role as Joey's father. He just wanted to be a very important role in Joey's life. However, nothing they had to offer suited Jerry. He only wanted what he wanted and would not have any part of any compromise. If it was not his way, 
it was no way. In the end, Jerry's court bit successful. According to Mike and Kathy, he began to harass them with phone calls in the middle of the night. Undeterred, Mike, Kathy, and Joey moved to Orlando in June of 1990. By then, Kathy was pregnant again. Joey appeared to be in Orlando. Then, just two months after the move, she received a surprise phone call from Jerry. He announced that he was moving there, too. At first, she was a bit leery about it. They had just escaped his badgering harassment and the court case get away from it all. On the other hand, they were hoping that it would be a positive thing for Joey. Jerry arrived in Orlando on October 4th, 1990. He rented an apartment just two miles from Mike and Kathy's house, just going to make do with the situation. They were happy because it seemed like things were going to work out for everyone. They let Jerry have Joey for long periods of time. They did not put any restrictions on his visits. Jerry picked up Joey at school for his regular weekend visit. Later, some teachers and parents remembered that his pickup truck was full of household items. The following Sunday, he did not bring Joey home. Kathy was, of course, devastated that Joey had been abducted. She always had it in the back of her mind that it could happen, but she never really thought that it would. Five months after Joey and Jerry disappeared, a missing child received an anonymous call. The caller claimed to be a friend of Jerry's. However, the agency suspected that it was Jerry himself who had made the call. He said that Joey was okay and that he was sorry that things happened the way they did. He then said that they California the next day. When the agency employee asked for more information, he became belligerent, saying that he was tired of fathers getting the short end of the stick in these situations. He also said that Kathy should not have taken Joey to Orlando in the first place. Well, to determine exactly where the call was placed from. However, they believed it occurred on the West Coast. They also believe that Jerry has no intention of returning Joey to Kathy. At Christmas and on Joey's sixth birthday, Kathy and Mike wrapped presents at the room. Although there have been no leads since the Seattle phone call, they hope that he will soon be back home. Kathy said that what she had gone through is a mother's worst nightmare not knowing where he is and if he is okay. Every children in the recovery room around his age. She wonders if he was going through the same thing. The state of Florida had issued a warrant for Jerry's arrest on charges of interfering with parental custody. The authorities believe he is most likely to be in New York or the suspects, Jerry Moss. Extra notes. This case first aired on Unsolved Mysteries, December 4th of 1991. It was updated on February 19th of 1992. Results Solved On October 3rd, 1991, before this case even aired, Jerry was arrested in Socorro, New Mexico. Viewers had recognized his photograph on a promotional announcement for Unsolved Mysteries. One viewer told authorities where he and Jerry were living and using the names Jerry and Mark staggered. When authorities arrived at their home, they found Jerry packing his belongings as he had also seen the promo. He told police that he was tired of running and glad that it was all over. Joey was immediately placed in custody and Kathy was informed that he had been found safe. The next day, Kathy, Mike, and their 11-month-old daughter, Elizabeth, arrived in Albuquerque, New Mexico, and were finally reunited with Joey. The reunion was made even more special when it was to Elizabeth for the first time. Kathy was overjoyed to see him, hold him, and have him back after a year. 
he returned home to Orlando and began to readjust to life with Kathy, Mike, and Elizabeth. Today, Joey is a doctor living. Uh, Mario Amato, real name Mario Vicente Amato, nicknames, no known nicknames, Haitian, Rosarito Baja, California, Mexico, date June 6th, 1992, the case, details, for thousands of American tourists, the breathtaking sunsets of Mexico have always been an invitation for romance, fantasy, and adventure. In June 1992, 49-year-old Joe Amato and his 29-year-old brother Mario, a welder, left Los Angeles. Friends, they were headed to Rosito Beach, Mexico, a popular seaside resort 35 miles south of San Diego. But their weekend in the sun would soon disintegrate into a nightmare. The next day, Mario was arrested after a fight with his girl. Ninety minutes later, he was found dead in a jail cell. The local authorities claimed that he had committed suicide. Joe, however, is convinced that he was murdered. He is determined to figure out what really happened to him. Mario first American tourist to die in a foreign jail, and his family is not the first to be haunted by the vague details of an official investigation. In such cases, facts are few and clues are hard to come by. However, Joe is determined to learn exactly what happened to him during his brief captivity. As a result of his efforts, this potentially explosive case has sparked the interest of high-level government officials, including an American congressman and the president of Mexico. The Amada arrived in Rosito Beach just after 1 a.m. on June 6, 1999. They were staying at a condo owned by a relative of Mario's girlfriend, Paula. Joe and his girlfriend, Deborah Debbie Larson, eagerly accepted the invitation to come along. Two couples immediately broke out the tequila and started partying. At around 4 a.m., Joe was feeling tired, so he and Debbie decided to go to bed. At about 7 a.m., they woke up to the sound of Mario and Paula bickering. Mario told Joe and Debbie to leave because Paula was driving him crazy. However, Joe told him to go to sleep. Debbie was concerned because she knew that Mario really liked Paula. She figured that he would not want to leave unless something serious was going on. Morning, he and Paula had apparently patched up their differences. According to Joe, he seemed happy and nothing appeared to be wrong. He said that he was going to the bar. That was the last time Joe saw him. That afternoon, Joe and Deb went to drive along the coast of Baja, California. They assumed that Mario and Paula were getting along fine. However, at one point, the two got into another argument and she kicked him out. A few minutes later, shortly before 4.30 p.m., police officers Hondo after receiving reports that he had struck her. She declined to file assault charges, but signed a complaint against him for being drunk and disorderly. He was then arrested for public drunkenness and disorderly conduct and taken to the police station. He was placed in a holding cell but never formally charged with a crime. According to the police, they wanted to hold him until he could sober up and pay a fine. At around 6.30 p.m., Joe and Debbie returned to the condo. They were surprised to find it vain. He under the mat was missing. A maid from the condominium complex explained that there had been 
problems there a few hours earlier and that the police came. Debbie crawled through a window to get them inside. As they looked around, they noticed broken kitchen. Almost immediately afterward, four police officers showed up, asking for Paula by name. They wanted to know where she was. Joe and Debbie suggested to check the bar next door. Suspicious, Debbie followed them to the bar. They were frantically looking for Paula there. A short time later, Paula came back to the condo, acting as if nothing was wrong. Joe and Debbie asked her where Mario was. She said she did not know. Two hours after she returned, a group of detectives arrived, who still had no idea that Mario had been arrested. The detectives informed him that Mario was dead and asked him to come to the police station to identify the body. At first, he thought they had made a mistake. He could not believe what was happening. To him, it there. Joe went with the detectives to the police station. He identified Mario after being shown pictures of him lying on the concrete floor of the jail cell. His eyes were closed and he was only wearing pants. Joe asked what happened and why he was not wearing his... The detective said that sometime after 5 p.m., Mario killed himself by tying one end of his sweater around his neck and tying the opposite end on a crossbar on the cell door. He said the bar was three feet off the ground. Joe didn't and how he could have hung himself from that height. The detective said he was very drunk and very heavy. Joe asked if there was anyone in the jail to stop Mario from hanging himself. The detective said that everyone was asleep at that time. Joe could not understand Four men were asleep at 5.30 in the afternoon. He did not believe that and believed that something was wrong with the whole scenario. Mario died three months short of his 30th birthday. Joe was forced to return to the United States without him. Can authorities refused to release the body until after they had completed their autopsy, and they would not tell Joe when that would happen. Within a week, the Mexican autopsy was completed. It listed the cause of death as loss of oxygen to the brain. Mario hanging himself. Joe believed that was preposterous. He recalled that one of the Mexican doctors who examined Mario's body told him that Mario had internal injuries. The doctor believed that he had been in a fight. Joe organized at the Mexican border, holding signs and wearing T-shirts with Mario's picture. He also contacted his congressman, Howard Berman. Congressman Berman noted that the Mexican autopsy confirmed the report of the jailers in Tijuana that Mario had hung his own sweater. He stated that when there is a report from a local foreign authority stating that a prisoner killed himself. It always makes sense to view that kind of report with some suspicion. He said that suicide by hanging is the oldest excuse for a jail murder ever been given. As soon as Mario's body was returned to the United States, Joe hired an independent pathologist to conduct a second autopsy. The autopsy concluded that internal injuries to Mario's liver were strong evidence punched in the upper abdomen. Report stated that in light of such injuries, the victim would not likely have been able to hang himself. The pathologist believed that Mario most likely passed out or went into shock due to internal bleeding from his injuries. Herman believes that Mario was beaten and then hung or choked with an unknown instrument and not his sweater to make it look like a suicide. Ultimately, in October of 1992, the Los Angeles County Coroner reviewed both the American and autopsy reports. He determined that Mario had probably been murdered. 
After reviewing autopsy photographs, he noticed an abrasion or welt on Mario's neck that was inconsistent with being hung by a sweater. He believes that it was thin cord or rope. He also noticed shoulder and back abrasions, as well as a scalp hemorrhage that seemed inconsistent with suicide. Joe believes that the injuries indicate that Mario was dragged into the cell right before he was hung. There is one other disturbing element to this case, the fact that Mexican authorities violated international agreements by not contacting the U.S. consul as quickly as possible following his death. Congressman Berman believes that a cover-up took place the people involved in the death did not want authorities coming quickly to the scene of the crime, and they wanted a period of time to elapse. They hoped that Joe would forget about it, go back to the United States, and drop the whole issue. Juan Pont, for Mexican Legal Affairs, claims that when a foreign person dies and there are no relatives or friends, Mexican authorities will quickly contact the U.S. consult about it. However, if family and friends are there when the person dies, they will contact the by letter days later. Eventually, Congressman Berman contacted the then-president of Mexico, Carlos Salinas de Gattare. Gattare promised to reopen the investigation in January 1993, Mario's body for yet another autopsy. Pounce believed that the truth will come out of the full investigation that they were making with the U.S. government. He said the cooperation is necessary because there are witnesses and evidence in the United States. The people that killed Mario to suffer for it because he and the rest of Mario's loved ones are suffering. He said that Mario's death will not just go away. He wants their lives to be ruined, just like how his and his family's lives have been ruined. In the near future, the results of the new autopsy will be released to Mario's family. At this time, the Mexican government plans to bring criminal charges if their investigators can prove he was indeed murder. Suspects. Mario said that the police officers who arrested him also assaulted him. And when he died, they tried to stage it as a suicide. They also believe the others in law enforcement helped cover it up. Evidence found in independent autopsies indicate death was indeed murder and not a suicide. There is speculation that his girlfriend, Paula, might somehow be involved in it. Four men were in the cell with Mario at the time. They allegedly were asleep at the time of his death and did not. Joe does not believe that and the suspects that they may have seen the killing take place. Mario's family admits that he has been despondent in the past about his chronic alcoholism. He once said to Joe, I do not care if I... However, Joe does not believe that he committed suicide. Here are some extra notes. The first case aired on March 17, 1993. Mario's girlfriend's real name was not used. She was named P Cast. Joe helped get attention to several other cases of Americans who were being treated poorly or died in Mexican jails. Some sources state that Mario was hung from the crossbar of the cell window. Interestingly, Berman has a another case featured on the show. One of his interns, Joyce Chiang, died suspiciously in 1999. Results. Unresolved. As a result of the third autopsy, which was completed in 1993, enough evidence was found to prove that Mario was murdered. 
Fibers found embedded in his neck were determined by the FBI to have come from a rope, not a sweater. It was also noted that the trauma to his neck was too narrow and caused by a sleeve or any part of a sweater. It was more consistent with a rope. It is now believed that he was severely beaten in his jail cell and then strangled with a rope prior to having his death scene staged to look like a suicide. On May 8, 1993, 35-year-old Jose, Jose Antonio Berzusco Flores was arrested and charged with Mario's murder. He was a Rosarito municipal police officer assigned to the jail. One witness, a suspect being held in an adjoining cell, claimed that Mario argued with and insulted Flores, who angrily entered the cell. The witness heard the sound of a blow and then heard Mario cry out in vain. A few minutes later, Mario was found dead. The witness viewed during the initial police investigation. A second witness gave similar testimony to investigators. Investigators believe that Flores was trying to subdue Mario in his cell but got carried away. Flores and two other municipal officers he did not arrive at work that day until after Mario was found dead. He also claimed that the witnesses framed him because he arrested them many times. Investigators, however, claimed that he was unable to provide a convincing alibi. They noted that the testimony of the other officers was inconsistent. They also speculated that the other officers may have been involved in a cover-up. In January 1996, Flores was tried and convicted of intentional harm Mario's death. He was sentenced to eight and a half years in prison. However, just four months later, in May of 1996, an appeals court overturned Flores' conviction and he was released. Under Mexican law, he could not and The court claimed that Mario's autopsy did not rule out homicide and that even if a murder occurred, Flores was not on duty and not on jail when it occurred. According to one report, other inmates testified that they had seen Mario be an officer in his cell. However, they said that Flores was not the attacker. Mario's case remains unsolved. Joe believes that at least two officers were involved in the murder. Sadly, in 1995, Mario's father passed away. When Debbie later married, he is still hoping to find out who was responsible for Mario's death. Appearance of Morgan Heimer from Grand Canyon National Park. Morgan Elias Heimer disappeared June 2nd of 2015. River Mile 213 near Pumpkin Springs, Colorado River, Grand Canyon National Park. Advised March 2021. 22 year old Morgan Elias Heimer was working as a commercial guide for Tour West a rafting company. The group was on day six of an eight-day trip to the Colorado River when, out of the blue, thing. he was never found. Who was Morgan Heimer? Morgan Heimer was from Cody, Wyoming, and was enrolled at the University of Wyoming studying English. He was an experienced outdoorsman river guide and swimmer. The river trip to Pumpkin Springs. Morgan was last seen on Tuesday, June 2nd, 2015 at approximately 4 p.m. around River Mile 213 near Pumpkin Springs in the Grand Canyon National Park. Henry said lead guide about taking some time off that afternoon. 
The lead guide walked away from the cliff to talk to a client, and when he looked back, Heimer was gone. The guide assumed he'd gone on break, but he was never seen again. For Heimer, he was reported missing at 7.26 p.m. on the same day by a member of the river trip following a swim in the river by the group. After he failed to turn up for dinner, he was wearing a dark colored astral personal vice, a blue plaid long sleeve shirt, a pair of Chaco flip flops, sandals, a maroon baseball cap and brightly colored shorts and carrying a purple water bottle. Searcher said at the time, he definitely has the skills and ability to perform the job. Be a person we have a high likelihood to find. Park rangers and search and rescue teams extensively searched the river between river miles 211 to 225 and on land searching from river mile 211 to 215. Rings. They then extended the search area to Diamond Creek, 12 miles west of Pumpkin Springs. Fellow employees of the Tour West Guide Service, clients on that river trip, and other river outfitters and their clients were interviewed. But nothing and searchers assumed he must have drowned. What happened to Morgan Heimer? Despite this extensive six-day search, Morgan was never seen again, and no evidence was found. What happened on that day in June 2015? Accidentally fall into the Colorado River? Was he drowned and caught in a branch or under a rock? Did he wander off and get lost in the wilderness? Very strange indeed for this man who was leading the tour group and was seen by the water's edge one minute and then the next. The disturbing disappearance of Arvin Nelson in Los Padres National Forest. Nelson disappeared in August 6 of 2014, Ventana Wilderness, Los Padres National Forest, California. Revised January 2024. Arvin Walter Nelson, 51, began his solo backpack Sir Station in the Los Padres National Forest on August the 6th of 2014. Starting his hike at the China Camp Trailhead, he intended to hike for a week in the Pfeiffer Big Sur State Park, focusing on the Ventana. And he was wearing brown hiking boots and a blue backpack. He never made it back. Who is Arvin Nelson? Arvin was an African-American male, born on March 30th, 1963, weighing 200 pounds and six feet tall. He was a server at the Big Sur River End and was a substitute teacher in Las Gatos, California, during the slower parts of the year. He took classes at Monterey Peninsula College and was interested in marine biology. He was a regular in Island Hot Springs near Big Sur for night bathing from 1 to 3 a.m. He had a reputation for being very friendly and fun, as well liked at work, and had a close network of friends. Arvin loved hiking and was experienced with regular Californian trips. What is the Pfeiffer Big Sur State Park in Ventana Wilderness? Fiverr Big Sur State Park is a state park in Monterey County, California, near the area of Big Sur, on the state's central coast, 26 miles south of Cam It covers approximately 1,006 acres of land and is centered on the Big Sur River. It has also been nicknamed the Mini Yosemite. The park's roots are in homesteading. Originally from France, John Pfeiffer settled 160 acres here. His 
1884 cabin, perched initially high above the Big Sur River, had been reconstructed along the park's gorge trail. In 1933, Pfeiffer's land became the first part of the park. He spurned offers from developers, 210,000 pounds from a Los Angeles developer, and sold it to the state of California a decision that prompted the State Park Commission to name its newest addition after him. The area has view to Lucia Mountains and has a small network of well-marked trails, with particular views of the Big Sur Valley and the Big Sur River Gorge, along with the Pacific Ocean. The Ventana Wilderness of Los Pedras National Park is a federally wilderness area in the Santa Lucia Range along the central coast of California. The wilderness was established in 1969, and the total acreage of the wilderness is now 240,026 acres. The Pine Ridge at Big Sur Station near Pfeiffer Big Sur State Park is the most popular starting point to access the Ventana. Still, as of August 2017, the trail was blocked by multiple washouts along creeks and dozens of fallen the path and is now closed indefinitely. Other trailheads include Botker's Gap, Los Pedras Dam, China Camp, and Arroyo Seco. Much of the area is very rugged and trails within the wilderness are frequently overgrown challenging to follow. Off-trail hiking can be arduous due to the steep, unstable terrain and dense vegetation, like Pacific Madron, Manzanita, and Sinothuis. The signage in the area is said to be poor, and the distance are meaning it is essential to have a good map and compass. Arvin's Hike into the Ventana Wilderness Arvin was dropped off by a friend at China Camp near Tassajara Road and planned to hike the eastern side of the Ventana, including parts of the Pine Ridge Trail, an area he had never visited before. The location was deep in the forest. He had water and food to last a week from August 6th to August 14th, and the trail was only 23 miles long with an elevation of feet, so it would be an easy hike for Arvin. He was expected to arrive at the Big Sur station on August 14th of 2014. Nelson told friends that if he didn't make contact with them at that time agreed, they should report him missing. Arvin reported missing in the search. When he didn't show up as agreed on the 14th, his friends notified the authorities an official search and rescue operations on August 16th in the area where he was last seen. Monterey County Sheriff, including Commander John Thornburg, the National Guard, the U.S. Forest Service, the California Highway Patrol, and the Coast Guard were all involved in the search with the help of three helicopters and approximately 30 searchers on the ground daily. The last known sighting was on August 6th when he met Jack English, who'd lived for 13 years in an isolated cabin in the Ventana wilderness, and his son, Dennis. Dennis was playing the guitar inside, and Arvin approached the cabin after hearing the music. They hung out when the helicopter picked up the father and son two days later on the 8th. Arvin stayed and saw them off. He told them he planned to wait until the 9th and hike 11 miles to Skies Hot Springs on August 10th. Skies is a very popular camp, and the 10-mile Sur Station to Sykes is described as strenuous and takes around six hours of hiking. Elevation gain and loss are considerable, and trees have fallen across the trail, making passage difficult. To get to the area, you must cross the big circle times, 
and the river can be impassable during winter and spring due to high and fast flowing water. Wildfires, including the Sabaranas fire in June 2017 and heavy winter storm damage in 2016, 17, completely wiped out the trail to Sykes Camp and the hot tubs themselves. Since Sykes is in a federally designated wilderness and within a protected wild and scenic river corridor, the tubs were illegal impoundments and structure inconsistent with wilderness's character. When access to Sykes Hot Spring is reestablished, man-made tubs will be excluded. Nelson had taken a lot of gear and food with him because of the time he had planned for the solo hike. For this reason, he's continued their search for longer than they usually would, as his chance of survival were higher. But nothing at all was found. No backpack, clothing, or body. What happened to Arvin Nelson? Injury. The area where Arvin went missing is backcountry, but well hiked and you would expect to pass a couple of people. The hike that Arvin was on ended up near Caramel, with a monastery nearby. Apart from a few areas, it is not difficult to hike. Vegetation. Did he move off trail and slip and get injured in an area subsequently burnt by wildfires? There have been many fires in the area, and the regrowth might obscure a body hinder search and rescue or hide a drop-off. Cross over near the coast near Highway 1 and slip and fall over a cliff? On his way back to Sykes, did Arvin fall into the Big Sur River with his backpack weighing him down? Suicide. His friends have confirmed no suicidal tendencies and Arvin was described as a larger-than-life figure. Animal attack. A grizzly or wild boar attack is possible, but no sign of an animal attack was found. There are many snakes in the area, but big cat activity. Foul play. According to Arvin's friends, J.O. Rear and Jason Chalas, there were many unscrupulous people in the Ventana wilderness in 2014. Illegal pot growers. War games go on in that area. And so on. Could Arvin have stumbled across something and was killed? It is described as a rough, rowdy sort of backcountry with rough people. Perhaps the attack could have been racially motivated was African-American. Did something happen at the Jack English cabin? Were they involved in Arvin's disappearance? Did thieves target the cabin as Jack made violin bows costing $2,000 each? Or did our serial killer operating in the area? The Strange Disappearance of Mary Sloan from Mount Graham. Lucille Sloan disappeared September 3, 2015, Columbine area near Mount Graham, Arizona. Revised March 2021. 53-year-old Mary Sloan went on a group trip to Mount Graham, Arizona on September 3, 2015 in the Columbine area. The eight hikers pitched camp off of a Forest Service access road, not at an established campground, and Mary was last seen at around 8.30 p.m. when several of the group went to sleep. It was about a quarter mile from Grandview Peak Road and about two miles from Riggs Lake and was situated close to a steep cliff. The area is isolated and some way up a curving mountain road. Mary was still dealing with the loss of 
who passed away a few months before the trip. The next morning, Mary was not in her tent, and her cell phone, purse, and bag were left at the campsite. It appears that she had not slept in her tent. She had vanished. She was wearing a green and blue jeans the last time she was seen. A ground search began on September 4th, 2015, and Arizona Department of Public Safety helicopter crews were dispatched on September 6th. Search and rescue personnel from Maricopa and Pima countries continued to search along the mountains and cliffs on September 8th. Graham County Search and Rescue Coordinator Lieutenant Jerry Nelson said rescue teams from multiple agencies combed the area the best they could, but could not come up with evidence of her whereabouts. Cadaver dogs from Maricopa County were used, and one appeared to have a hint in the area near the cliff that was the original base of the search. Mountain repelling teams were called back in, and one of the dogs was also roped down the side of the cliff in an effort to locate Mary. The cliff area was about 9,400 feet and dropped down through some catch areas to the base of the mountain at about 3,000 feet. Search efforts were suspended resources on Labor Day, but Nelson said they would resume Tuesday, September 8th. Sloan's sister, Sherry Brown, said they are not concerned about the suspended search. We are very appreciative for all the work they've done up to this point, but it was never found. She had disappeared off the face of the earth. Ottawa County, Jane Doe, 1975. A woman found floating in the water. Discovery. On the evening of October 22, 1975, two duck hunters found the body of a nude woman floating in a tributary of Mud Creek in Salem Township, Ottawa County, Ohio. Near West Mud Creek Road is approximately three or four miles southeast of the small village of Oak Harbor. Autopsy. The deceased's body was recovered and brought in for examination. With it being determined she maybe 48 to 72 hours prior to being found as decomposition had begun. While the cause of death was determined to be drowning, the case has been noted as suspicious, given Jane Doe wasn't wearing any clothes. There are of trauma found on her body. Details. Jane Doe is described as a white female between the ages of 20 and 30. With it possible, she was as old as 35. She stood around 5'4 or 5'5 and weighed 140 50 pounds and had medium length reddish brown hair and brown hazel eyes. While nude, she was wearing a wire love knot ring, also known as a Celtic knot ring and her ears were pierced. The autopsy revealed that the de poor dental health with damage noted to her teeth and a gap between those in the front of her mouth. There was also signs that she was a smoker and that she'd given birth within a year of her death, likely in late 1974. While her body remains an investigator who's looked into the case believes Jane Doe may have been the victim of human trafficking or died from a drug-related incident. Case contact information. Jane Doe's DNA is currently available for comparison. With information regarding the identity of Jane Doe or the circumstances surrounding her death is asked to contact the Ottawa County Sheriff's Office at 419-734-4404. Tips can also be called in to the FBI 
Tito's office at 419-243-6122. The death of Josephine Chaka. Early life. Josephine Chakism was from Moosney, located just south of Hudson Bay in northern Ontario. She came from a large family that included her parents, Joseph and Hannah Chakism, and her seven siblings, Anna, Juan, Remy, Teresa, Mary Louise, Peter, and Mike. At the time of her death, Josephine was just 17 years old death. Josephine was the last seen on the night of April 21st, 1970. She went out for the night and never returned home. Dates vary as to when the 17-year-old's body was discovered. Some sources claim it was the next day, while others state it was two days after. A hunter came across the teenager's body in the water. Terrio, Northern, railroad tracks. An autopsy was performed on Josephine's body, with the coroner determining she died of exposure. They also noted that there was no evidence of trauma. Satisfied with these findings, the Criminal Investigation Branch of Ontario Police closed the case less than a year later. Renewed Investigation Over 40 years later, in October 2017, Detective Inspector Giles DePreto announced that the OPP was reviewing cases involving indigenous people. Among them was Josephine's death. A review of the forensic pathology was ordered, and the results came back inconclusive, meaning homicide couldn't be ruled out. The last date from the OPP stated manager was going to review DNA and any persons of interest. Josephine's family alleges evidence was overlooked, including bruises and cuts on the 17-year-old's body because she was indigenous. They'd questioned the coroner's findings from the beginning. Chalkism telling the media prior to her death in 2022 that there was so much evidence along the tracks. This included her sister's cigarette lighter and glasses, which were found on the opposite side of the railway tracks, indicating a goal. Rachel also didn't believe Josephine died of exposure and claimed that an investigator had previously told her that her sister had trauma consistent with being hit in the head with a yet-to-be-identified weapon. There are also marks on her body case contact information. The current status of Josephine's case is currently unknown. Anyone with information regarding the case is asked to contact the Criminal Investigation Branch of the OPP at 1-888-3-1122. Gwinnett County, Jane Doe, 2023. Discovery. On 2023, the decomposed body of an unidentified female was discovered on private property in the 4300 block of Abbott's Bridge Road in Duluth, Gwinnett County, Georgia. The mostly skeletal remains were found by the son of the property owner. Commercial site. It's not clear exactly where on the property Jane Doe's remains were found. Autopsy. The decedent's remains were brought to the Gwinnett County Medical Examiner's Office, where it was determined she died between 2022 to 2000, with the most likely time frame being within four months of her being discovered. Given the level of decomposition, a cause of death could not be determined. Details. The decedent is described as an African-American woman between the ages of 20 
55. She stood between 5'1 and 5'5 and was found wearing a camisole, size small, with a cross back. Given the state of decomposition, her weight and eye color could not be determined. However, a detailed description of her hair with reports stating it was either black or brown in color, featured long extensions, and was braided with ring-style accessories in it. Jane Doe had a number of notable features, the most prominent of which were her several piercings. Her tongue pierced, along with either her nose or lip, and she had two dermal piercings on her back, possibly the lower section, as well, she had a tattoo on her upper back, near her neck or shoulder. While the state of the remains made it difficult to fully discern the image. Described as being banner style, with red and blue as the prominent colors. Investigation. On June 20th, 2023, investigators conducted a search at the home of 52-year-old Abdorihem Halal at 7.48. Boulevard in Decatur, DeKalb County, Georgia. This was the second search of the property, with the first occurring on April 29th when Halal was taken into custody for allegedly causing an explosion at a Bank of America ATM at the North Cabal the previous month. While Halal faces both federal and local charges in connecting to the ATM bombing, Investigators haven't revealed his relation to Jane Doe's case. According to local records, he's not the owner of the Abbott's Bridge property, and it's unclear if he's a tenant. Case Information Anyone with information regarding Jane Doe's case is asked to contact the Duluth Police Department at 770-497. Five zero zero. Tips can also be submitted to the Gwinnett County Medical Examiner's Office at 678-442-3161. Deanna Crimin, A Tragic and Unsolved Murder. What happened to Deanna Crimmin? Deanna Crimmin was 17 years old and living in her hometown of Somerville, Massachusetts. Those described her as a fun, outgoing, charismatic young woman with an infectious smile. With her blonde hair and green eyes, Deanna had always been aware of what a young and beautiful woman she was becoming. She was one of six children brothers and two sisters. Because of her love for children, Deanna was pursuing her goal in becoming a preschool teacher by working three days a week in an early childhood development course at the East Side Somerville Community School. In addition, she was a junior at high school, held together babysitting gigs and worked part-time as a cashier. According to Deanna's mother, Catherine, the hard-working young woman always sought to help others in need and identified with the underdog. On March 29, 1985, after her 17th birthday, she turned in a school assignment outlining the five most important goals in her life. When asked to narrow down the most important of the five, she chose living a long and healthy life. Deanna had a boyfriend she had been dating named Thomas LeBlanc, who was 18 years of age. On that same evening of March 29th, Deanna hung out with Thomas, promising her mother that she'd be home by 10. Deanna's curfew came and went. When midnight rolled around, who was waiting up for her? Paige, Deanna. But the concerned mother never received a call back. Assuming she decided to spend the night at Thomas's place, she went to bed since she needed to be up early for work the next day. The following morning, March 30, 
Children, whom Deanna previously babysat, were taking a shortcut to their school and discovered a body lying behind a housing complex on Jackwe Street. Authorities soon determined that it was the body of Deanna Kremen. The beautiful young girl loved had been strangled, sexually assaulted, and left out in the open behind a senior housing complex. Deanna was found lying on her back with nothing on her upper body other than an open red jacket and underwear pulled off her right leg. The medical office determined that she had died by strangulation. Investigation once the investigation into Deanna's murder was launched, detectives went door to door canvassing the neighborhood in search of anyone who may have witnessed activities. Of course, her boyfriend, Thomas LeBlanc, the last person to see Deanna, was questioned and told police that he walked her halfway home at around 10 p.m. the night before and believed she made it home safely. A couple of days after she was late, it was announced that authorities were questioning a firefighter from a well-known family in the area named Charlie Halton. 36-year-old Halton personally knew Diana, having gone to the same high school with her mother. At one point in time, Charlie helped care for her driving exam, and Diana's younger brother once claimed to have caught Charlie and Deanna kissing in his car. Some of her friends said that he had become fixated on her. While this behavior landed him on police radar, he was soon ruled out as a, as was an unnamed sexual predator who was wanted in the area for other crimes. Another suspect was Deanna's stepfather, Michael Kremen, who was a violent alcoholic and drug abuser. Catherine reported that Michael had once pulled a gun on their oldest daughter and Asian had killed the family pet. However, the most suspicious was Deanna's boyfriend, Thomas LeBlanc, who did not attend her funeral. According to Catherine, Thomas always walked Deanna home. The fact that he said he walked her only halfway was unusual. Her death, friends began coming forward, sharing stories about Thomas being controlling and abusive, and not only with Deanna. Thomas's mother, who suffered from multiple sclerosis, claimed that he possessed a violent streak, even towards his mother, to her filing a restraining order against her son. Catherine Kremen stated that Deanna was planning on breaking up with Thomas, in addition, Deanna's friends reported seeing him with scratches on his neck and face right after her murder. Thomas and his alibi Jason pleaded the fifth during the grand jury trial, where Jason's father, an attorney who had done legal work for various high-ranking members of the city, represented his son. Thomas was never indicted, and his friendship with Jason come to an end. Years later, Catherine revealed that after Deanna's death, she read through old letters from Thomas to her daughter and came to a conclusion that he was indeed obsessed with Deanna. Thomas continued refusing to answer or take a polygraph exam. It has been almost three decades since Deanna Kremen's death and it still remains unsolved. And that, dear listeners, brings it close to these three plus hours of the unsolved. Before I go any further, I would like to acknowledge the elite members of Back to Ashes. Nat Davies, Stephanie McLaren, Tammy Slayton, Mrs. Innerscare, Chrissy Elias, Sugared Spite, Tina Mead, Cindy, Amy Klemko, Anita V, Dova Khaleesi, Edith Smith, 
Colt Stonewall, Luz Crispin, Samantha Plays, Patty's Niece, Denise S., Call Me Carter, Corpse Lover, and Cindy Cleveland. Thank each and every last one of you for your continued support. For without you, there would not be a me or a back to ashes. Thank you. If you are sleeping, I hope Slumberland is treating you comfortably. If you're awake, I hope you've enjoyed these cases. Until next time, please take care of yourselves and stay safe out there. Have yourself a good morning, a good afternoon, or a good evening. Peace, love, and light to you all.